Good morning, this is Jason Dean coming live at you again for another Film Fanatic show. It is about uh, 8 o'clock, 8 minutes after 8. It's um, Thursday, so I hope everyone's doing good. We uh, I had a pretty cool night last night. I had a totally last minute gig at the uh, Rockland Lobster Festival. And the Lobster Festival is... Uh, I don't know for for Maine for here living in Maine it's definitely one of the the biggest festivals uh that the state kind of offers. It has like a long uh it's been around uh as long as I can remember way before I even you know it was going on you know way before I ever moved here which was in the 90s so it's been going on for years and years and years. It's always been kind of the main tradition or a part of like the main tradition. But one of the coolest things back back uh, back in the day, like when I first came up to Maine, and then when I moved here in the late '90s, was the the music uh, that they would have at this festival. It was uh, you know, and I went there a few times uh, when I had moved here to see some incredible music, but then also. I was fortunate enough to play there once uh, or twice. But uh, the Maine Lobster Festival, they have, you know, the whole thing with rides and, like, you know, uh, onion blossoms, lobster rolls, all that kind of stuff, the touristy kind of thing. But they, uh, the big thing that they had for years ha were the, uh, the big national musical acts that they would get. At one point, like, they had uh, one year Willie Nelson played here played at the festival and they had the Neville brothers play there once I uh, was there for them I saw that show that was pretty amazing they also had Tower Power there once I saw them there um, and um, Steve Earle I think they had they've had a bunch of great names nowadays things are a little bit different I'm they don't seem to have the big national acts anymore for some reason, but they have like, uh, like nationally known cover bands, which is kind of weird. They don't really have the big names that they used to. I was fortunate enough to play. I during that time, it was probably like after I was living. I had moved to Maine and I was here for a few years. I was playing. I got this pretty cool gig, playing with this jazz group. Uh, that was called uh, Fascinating Rhythm. And they were kind of like modeled off of Fascinating Rhythm, which was kind of a pop jazz, you know, not really my cup of tea, but they were kind of this pop jazz group. They were a very popular group in the, you know, 70s and 80s. And Fascinating Rhythm was basically um, kind of modeled off of that. And it was a jazz group. It had four four vocalists in the band. And... I uh, had gotten asked to play drums for them. Basically, I was uh, playing with the piano player in the band. Her name was Joni Mitchell, which is funny, not the Joni Mitchell. And I was playing in this little jazz trio with her. On you know, uh, we we were playing a handful of gigs around Maine at the time. I was still really inexperienced. I had just got out of school, Berkeley College of Music. And I had, you know, very, very little experience playing jazz, but I was playing some jazz gigs with her at the time. <laughs> and um, she was also the piano player for this band. And she was also, like, the musical director. She did theater and all kinds of things, too. Huge background in music. And so Fascinating Rhythm was looking to, like, put together a band. So then I uh, she told them about me, and then I went there for, like, this audition... And luckily, I I got the gig, and then the bass player who was also playing with us at the time, Adam Chalinski, uh, who was like kind of this prodigy bass player, he also started playing bass in the band. So we were all like, both of us were hired to be part of the regular band. And they, uh, when we started playing, uh, right away we started playing lots of gigs, and we were playing all of these festivals, and uh, playing they took all of these kind of highfalutin gigs that were going on at the time. You know, we played all the, all of these gigs where we would play at like 
pretty big venues like amphitheaters uh mostly all in maine i think we played once or twice out of state like in new hampshire or massachusetts most of the gigs were all here in maine but we would play like big venues like the opera camden opera house rockport opera house these big kind of outdoor shows and concerts and it was for me it was a really great experience and and the show was paid really really well you know it wasn't necessarily my cup of tea of music but it was a great learning experience but they also uh one of the big things that the probably the biggest thing that that band did was they we got asked to play um and we got to open up for the temptations with you know famous you know doo-wop r&b group from the 60s and we did that uh twice where we had the option we played they got asked twice to play to open up for the temptations where they did it just solo without the band and then we ended up doing it the following year with the full band and that was a really great experience you know being able to open up you know play on this really massive stage in front of a lot of people you know and playing after these legendary performers uh, you know this legendary group so it was a really great experience and I learned a lot from that time and last night <clears throat> totally last minute we uh, 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 one of the bands I play in the Cornbread Muffins was asked uh, to play at the festival so we played last night at the festival and uh, and it, it was cool it was uh, pretty last minute it was nice playing on a really big stage you know and and all the equipment was provided nice light system really good sound system so it was cool and then I'm gonna be playing there again on Friday uh, with a band I play with quite a bit bone broth which is uh, kind of eclectic an eclectic mix of music it's all improvised and we uh, will be playing her uh, tomorrow on Friday early in the day uh, so very excited about that and then Saturday I'll I also got asked to play there for an hour set so it's kind of funny I'm playing like three gigs at this big festival but anyway so it was cool it was a good you know a good experience and uh you know it's it's a nice change it's been a while since i've played on you know a big big stage with the whole production and all that kind of a thing so uh and, we're, and also the biggest bonus is where everything you know all the equipment and all that stuff is more or less all provided for the performer so it's it's pretty cool so anyway, uh, today's show is on a movie that I really love and I have a pretty deep history with, and that is Poltergeist. Incredible movie, a movie that I grew up watching as a kid, always loved this movie. Uh, I think I remember seeing this in the theater, and yeah, I did see this in the theater when it first came out, and I've seen it a bunch of times. I picked up this edition uh, on Blu-ray, uh, it's probably a couple of years ago or a year ago. It's a really good edition, actually. There's some good special features on here. There, uh, the transfer of of this film on Blu-ray is pretty awesome, and it's definitely the best edition of this movie. That's the thing. I'm I'm such a proponent of Blu-ray 4K because you, you know, and I've said it many times where certain films or a lot of films that I've seen either growing up or just in general, you know, a movie, say, that I've seen 20, 30 times or more, when I finally get a good copy of it on Blu-ray or 4K, or if I just end up seeing it in that format, it's it's like seeing it for the first time. I mean, it really is. Because the the... The clarity is so good. Uh, the a lot of the times the the sound is remastered. You know all the detail. It's really rich. The colors pop more. It's just a and it's more so it makes for a, a much more immersive experience. Better than. In some ways, like my preferred way to see a movie is always to go, if I have a chance, is to go to the theater to see it. But I do have certain movies on Blu-ray, 4K, and I have a pretty good sound system here at my house, that there's certain movies that I own that I feel are, are even better than the theater experience, even more immersive. And so it's, it's great. It's, it's, to me, 
I can't stress it enough. Like it's the best way. If you're a movie collector or a movie fan, you can't beat it. I mean, it's it's the ultimate the ultimate experience in many many ways. Even too, in some ways, with you know, if you have a Blu-ray version of a movie, and it might not be a 4K version or a special edition, it might be just more of a standard Blu-ray. I find too that it can even be the case with certain Blu-rays that I have that are not necessarily special editions or 4K. They are still really, really uh, uh, awesome. But when I get the more special editions, particularly around newer films or newer editions of certain films on Blu-ray 4K, it's uh, you can't. Yeah, it, it it blows everything out of the water as far as I'm concerned. So it's uh, very very cool. And it's interesting too. I brought up that I just did a review on Oppenheimer, the lat latest uh, Christopher Nolan movie, and which is uh, a really awesome movie. Just really really great. I definitely speaking of going to theater to the theater, that's a movie I really really recommend to for folks to go see. It's uh you know it's a little bit of an undertaking. It's three hours long, but it's it's very very good. And uh, you know he's uh, he's an incredible director. So, and it, the thing was, is I did a review of that, of Oppenheimer, I think it was last week. And uh, I was talking about how I, I had just seen an interview with Christopher Nolan. And it was basically Killian Murphy, who's the star of Oppenheimer. It was basically Killian Murphy and Christopher Nolan. Uh, it was a YouTube kind of show. It was basically the two of them in a video shop and them just talking about movies. And it was really cool, really interesting. And you really get this perspective on how, you know, Christopher Nolan is a is just such a videophile, like so incredibly, insanely knowledgeable about movies. And it's sh it's a short video. It's only like 15 or 20 minutes, but it's there's so much information on there and it's so interesting. But he talked ab about... And he's a really f firm believer and definitely draws a line in the sand and, and carries a flag uh, as opposed to for the, the idea of, you know, movies are meant to be seen in the theater. Movies are meant to be seen with a group of strangers or by yourself in a dark room. Like, that's the way to experience a movie. And so he's... And he still shoots. He's one of the very few directors that still shoots on film. And he's really all about that. There's a few other directors that really do that, uh, that are big uh, proponents of that. Quentin Tarantino also is a director that really emphasizes that, still shoots on f film. Um, and Denny Villeneuve, who is another director, another modern director who I just really, really love. He's also very much, uh, he's very outspoken about that same kind of uh, opinion or opinions. And I, you know, I'm a firm, firm, firm believer in that also. I really prefer that. And I'm totally all about that whole way of that experience of going to see a movie. And, I, and I've said, too, where I've talked a lot about, you know, technology and streaming and, and the age that we live in. And it's very, things are just moving at a more, uh, at a faster rate that, you know, because of technology, that it's hard to see where things are always, you know, see where things are going. And the trajectory of things just moves so fast, especially in the digital age. And it's a thing, too, of where, you know, people who are consumers like myself but then people who are also uh the artists you know also i guess people like myself more so in the w realm of music but it's all the same kind of thing you can't if you have complaints or you don't feel technology is is serving the greater good you know you have and you feel like there's a lot of adversity. And I feel like for me, in some ways, things are better now than ever as far as what technology offers. I think that there is less of a 
there's less borders and there's less boundaries as far as well I think as far as when it comes to creating art I think there's more of a space for cross-pollinization you know meaning that you can take multiple genres and mix them together more uh there's there's a little bit more of a sense of open-mindedness to to that where before you couldn't really do that things were very very specific uh geared to to a very specific genre but i think because of the internet things are are less rigid and there's more of a chance to be exposed to more and new things and and also i notice too lots of bands and groups that i like and that i love are incorporating even more unique styles and creating it more of a unique style and that at one point was maybe considered to be a negative thing or a taboo so it's interesting but at the same time it also has many many negatives but i think overall it's it's got more positives but i think there are definitely n negative things around it as far as what artists can make for uh financial compensation Lack of ticket sales, like for movies, movie theaters having to close down. But, so, I don't know, it's a funny balance. It's a funny balance. And then people not buying music anymore and only buying records or, you know, those kinds of things. But, and you, people can be more self-sustained, but, and people can get a, each get individually, each artist can get individually a bigger piece of the pie or a piece of the pie. But it's at the end of the day, not a whole lot of money and it's not worth that effort sometimes because the pieces are smaller, but yet an artist can amass a following and even to a degree distribution, have this huge distribution and get their art out there to a point where it's essentially for free and reach this huge, huge audience. And you can, and artists are able to do that uh, completely independently that never was a thing before you know so you had to work with like a major distri distributor or a major record label you know all those kinds of things so it's it's an interesting thing it's a it's a mixed bag you know but but the one thing you cannot do and what people cannot do is you can't stop technology so it's always this thing of having to ad adapt to it to a degree for good or bad but Christopher Nolan was, and I'm I'm very much, I've talked a lot about the quality of when you watch films on, you know, when you watch movies on Netflix or you watch things through any kind of streaming service. For me, the reason I don't really like it, I think it has gotten better, the technology, but for the most part, in my experience, whenever I watch a film in that format, I've always talked about, however the technology is used to to show a lot of these films through streaming platforms there's a an area of where i feel like everything the sound the picture everything the pixelation is off and there's this weird um compression that's put on films and that like the quality just isn't good the sound just isn't good the pixelation a lot of the times is off the color is off too it uh, like dark scenes tend to be too dark where it's almost to the point of where it's hard to see what's going on and i attribute that to compression so however the technology however the technology you know when they use this technology to be able to stream certain films and shows it does something to to the uh the way it's it's viewed because it's streamed um and it was interesting and again, it's not something technically I know about, like how how they actually what the actual process is behind it, but I get the sense, and that's been my experience, just from viewing it and consuming media that way. You know, and it goes for music and film. And it was interesting in this Christopher Nolan interview, he talked about that very specific thing where that's one of the things that drives him crazy, and that he doesn't really agree with with that way of consuming media and i thought that was pretty cool uh somebody who actually knows what they're talking about 
is saying the same thing that I'm saying. So that was pretty cool. And he talked about the same thing, that same idea of like the compression and the pixelation a lot of the times for certain movies is off and the sound is even sandwiched. So it was interesting. And I felt, I don't know, I thought that was cool. So today's movie, like I said, is about Poltergeist. Classic movie, classic, classic movie. I think it's a really unique example of two iconic directors, and you can see their styles. Poltergeist uh, came out in 1982. It was a big commercial hit. It was, I don't know, in some in some areas, to a degree, it, it kind of has this family friendly vibe to it. It it it, it was a pretty big it was a huge commercial hit i remember when it came out and the interesting thing is that it was directed by toby hooper one of you know one of the greatest directors i think ever who recently passed away most known for the iconic texas chainsaw massacre he also directed texas chainsaw massacre 2 he also directed uh life force which is such an awesome movie uh, he's done some really great movies. One of my favorite directors. One of my favorite horror directors. But Poltergeist was his biggest commercial film. It was like a big Hollywood production. And the interesting thing about that movie, about Poltergeist, is uh, Steven Spielberg originally, I believe, was going to direct it. And he wrote it. He co-wrote the script. But then he passed on it and gave, the movie was given to Toby Hooper. So, and of course, everybody knows who Steven Spielberg is, where he directs these more or less, I mean, he's an iconic director, amazing director. Probably my favorite Spielberg movie of all time is Jaws. Um, and Close Encounters of the Third Kind. But a lot of his films all have this appeal where they, you, you, you can take pretty much your entire family to see any of his films. So it has a little bit of that mass appeal, but yet I feel like his good films still have uh, that really great quality, uh, what great qualities of what make a great film a great film. But his stuff has a little bit of a commercial appeal. He's got a lot of characters uh, that are based, you know, in like a family dynamic. And it's got, it kind of got that appeal for adults and for kids. And I every time I watch Poltergeist, especially now when I watch it, um, now is I see that I see those two kind of combinations where Toby Hooper came out of the real independent low budget gritty horror world and then Steven Spielberg coming out of the big Hollywood world and and I think you see both of those styles on the big screen it's a, it's a very interesting mixture of big and big budget and also to a degree low budget you know commercial or to a degree, a glossy kind of production, but then it also has a little bit of the gritty realism. And this was a huge, you know, huge movie and a huge movie for Toby Hooper because, again, he came out of, you know, kind of the underground, like kind of out of the exploitation world with what he did with Texas Chainsaw Massacre. So seeing him, you know, be propelled to being like this major, major player in Hollywood and like, Working with, you know, one of the large, the biggest directors in the world, Steven Spielberg, is pretty interesting. And to still see that he retains some of those kind of aesthetics is very cool. Of course, you know, Poltergeist has a really iconic cast. Heather O'Rourke, Zelda Rubinstein, Joe Beth Williams, Craig T. N N N Craig T. N Nielsen, Dominique Dune, Oliver Robbins... And Corey Burton. Um, it's, you know, and this film also ha has like a little bit of a dark cloud around it. Um, particularly around a series of events that happened during the f filming of this movie, but then also... This this movie turned into a pretty pretty big franchise. Two of the biggest things were two of the lead actresses died 
right after this movie was made, Dominique Dune was uh, was killed by her ex boyfriend uh, shortly after the um, movie had come out. Um, and the biggest thing was that Heather O'Rourke, who who plays who's the lead in this film, um, plays Carol Ann. Um, she died unexpectedly at the age of 12 from an intestinal disorder. So the, the, this movie's, and, and also these movies have always had a dark cloud around them, and she was very young. Um, but still, you know, I think this movie is still really, really uh, awesome and stands the test of time. This edition of this movie is pretty fabulous on Blu-ray. There's a lot of cool special features. I got this... I got this movie really randomly somewhere on Blu-ray. It was a place I had never... Um, it was like a flea market or something I went to. And they had a bunch of Blu-rays for really cheap. And I remember picking them up. And this is a really great, awesome edition. The other thing that's really cool about this movie is this, the, the, the special effects. You know, this came out um, many, many years ago. 1982 but and of course way before the the cgi digital age they did do a remake of this of poltergeist i think that came out eight or ten years ago which i haven't seen i heard it was really terrible but you know this movie came out obviously before see the emergence of the cgi technology so it was like you know uh all practical effects so the effects the effects in this movie are still really really awesome and I think, like, I, again, I think it's a great combination of styles of where it has a little grittiness to it, it has a rawness to it. You know, and you see that, and that's a big thing of Toby Hooper, but then it also has this big kind of Hollywood production and Hollywood uh, vibe to it, kind of a family vibe to it, and you see that influence from Spielberg. So it's a cool combination of both worlds to a degree. The... Uh, and, you know, great characters. And I think that the movie is a thrill ride. I think it's there's a lot of humor in the film. Great characters. They're all, you know, people you care about. And I and when it comes to the supernatural element, I think it's actually pretty scary. Like, it's actually got some darkness to it. So it's a cool balance of all of those styles. And I think it's a movie that can appeal to to uh, kids and then also to the adults. It's a really good balance of that. Although now I don't think, like when I, I used to work for a long time, I worked at the teen center in Camden, worked with kids. And one of the things we used to do, which was a lot of fun, was we used to watch movies with the kids. And now with things the way they are, where things are more, you know, people are, I don't know, all uh, up in arms about trying to make things politically correct. A lot of movies that we used to watch at the Teen Center were suddenly not allowed. Movies that we used to watch with the kids that were very popular were uh, <laughs> obvious. The obvious Harry Potter movies, the Lord of the Rings movies, the first three uh, movies like Gremlins, uh, Back to the Future, films like that. And now I remember suddenly those movies were not really allowed, especially like Gremlins, because of the the darker nature of those films, and that it was a little bit too much, and pushing the boundaries more for, you know, teenagers. So we tend, at the time, we, especially the later period of time, we worked with younger kids. So the PC cops were around, so there were a lot of films we couldn't really watch anymore, and, and, and I, and I think at one point this would have been a movie that could have possibly be, have been watched during that time, but not by today's standards. I don't think it would go over. I think it's a weird thing because I've done a show. I, well, I did a post a while ago on Facebook, and I, and I don't usually, I don't usually uh, do posts on Facebook. I try to just keep it on. I don't do any personal things. I don't really like to comment on people's videos and I don't like to get into all of the horse shit that happens on Facebook. I try to just use it for music stuff and sharing, you know, things that are, you know, apolitical or a philosophical, uh, you know, things that I just find really interesting. 
But I had, <clears throat> uh, last month I had posted a thing on Facebook before I was saying how, where I work now, and the kids that I'm around, they're granted, they're young kids, but most of the kids now are watching all the, the latest Pixar movies. And I like I like a lot of those movies. I think a lot of them are really great and high quality, and and they do have, you know, some appeal to where they, you know, adults can watch them and get get things out of them, and get enjoyment out of them. But then kids can watch them. But at the end of the day, I feel like, and I've been watching at work because we've had a lot of rain this summer, so a lot of the times we're trapped inside, and we've been watching movies. But I've seen. Uh, so many Pixar movies uh, this summer, and and uh, you know I had seen quite a few, and there's there's certain ones I really love that I own, but the ones we've been watching this summer I had never seen before, and I have to say, you know, obviously I'm at work and I'm doing a few other things, so I'm not like sitting and watching the movie and paying full on attention, but I have to say every movie I, that I've seen. Uh, it literally feels like the same kind of movie. I I don't. It's all blurred together. I don't know. Nothing really stands out to me uh, as being actually good or you know it's good and it's smart entertainment to a degree, but and kind of clever. But I don't feel like they're all the. I kind of feel like they're all the same movie. They all have the same kind of thing of where they they appeal to kids. They're they but they they also are trying to appeal to adults. And there's always these references to, in all of the Pixar movies, there's all these references to like pop culture. So it can kind of hook people in who are maybe of an older age. And, you know, references for pop culture, references for kids and then for adults. And I, the other thing too is everything is done at this really rapid pace, uh, rapid fire, where you're getting all of this stuff and all of this visual thing, all of these visual cues or elements where I almost feel it's kind of exhausting. Uh, and I think that that's a way of like hooking the kids into a lot of these films. But I had made a post saying, you know, but, but at the end of the day, these movies are just like, they're nice. They're just very nice. And, you know, very correct, I guess is the, the, Politically correct is the, the way I think of it, and I and I had said I had made a post on Facebook saying, um, you know, it's such a because when I was their age, when I was these kid, the kids that I take care of or, or work with, when I was their age, I was watching, you know, the Godzilla, the original Godzilla movies. I was watching all the Universal monster movies, you know, Frankenstein, Dracula. Um, and you know, watching and reading, uh, or reading comic books, um, and you know, watching um, TV shows like Voltron and and like the A Team and Thundercats, and you know, and just great classic and classic, you know, kind of monster movies, and and these kids are watching these other things that are not like. You know, I feel are cut from a totally different cloth. So it's I don't know. It's it's a it's it's weird that way. You know, it's a I don't know. And I've even had that happen where some of the kids would not watch some of the Pixar movies because their parents said, "Well, those are not they're not appropriate," or they're you know they're they give the kid nightmares. And I'm kind of like, "What these movies give you nightmares?" So I don't know. But anyway. I highly recommend if you've never seen a polter, seen Poltergeist, which you probably most people have. I highly recommend um, seeing this film on Blu-ray 4K because this it's really awesome. I do really want to watch this again. Uh, I've seen this movie a ton of times. I've only actually watched it once since I bought it on Blu-ray, but I'm going to watch this again. So thanks again. Um, this is Jason Dean, and have a great day. And we will see you next time. Peace.